In this video, I'll be introducing geodesics and Christoffel symbols in extrinsic geometry. I'm going to come back to these ideas later with intrinsic geometry, but for this video, all the geometry I do will involve 2D surfaces living in 3D space. This video will also be the first step toward understanding a very important idea in tensor calculus called the covariant derivative, which I'll talk about in future videos. If you want to learn more about geodesics, you can check out this professor's course notes. The link to them is in the description. So geodesics are basically the answer to the question of finding the shortest distance between two points. In flat space, this is pretty easy. The shortest distance between two points A and B is just a straight line. And the formula for this straight line is also pretty easy to get. We just take A as the starting point and add a vector pointing from A to B scaled by some time parameter lambda. And by choosing different values of lambda, we can get any point on this line. But things get more challenging when we try to find the shortest distance between two points on a curved surface. We generally can't draw straight lines on curved surfaces, so the process of finding the shortest distance between two points involves finding a special curve called a geodesic, which is basically like the straightest possible path in a curved space. That also minimizes the distance between two points. So before we study geodesics, why should we bother caring about them? Well, one of the main physics applications is in general relativity, where space-time is curved. Since space-time is curved, light doesn't travel in straight lines. Instead, light gets bent around massive objects like stars and black holes. And these curved paths that light travels along are actually the geodesic curves in space-time. These curves are basically the straightest possible paths that can be drawn in curved space-time. Now, space-time is a four-dimensional space, and the geodesics there can be pretty complicated. In this video, we're going to focus on geodesics on two-dimensional curved surfaces for simplicity. But the basic idea is more or less the same in any dimension. So to start off our discussion of geodesics, I'm going to ask a pretty basic question. How do we know if a path is straight in flat space? And to answer that, we're going to take a look at a curve's velocity vectors and acceleration vectors. So let's pretend we're traveling along this road at a constant speed. What would the velocity vectors look like? Well, the velocity vectors would just be the tangent vectors to this curve, so they would look like this. Now, what about the acceleration vectors? So the acceleration vectors would just be the change we see when looking at two tangent velocity vectors that are right next to each other. So the change between this tangent vector and this tangent vector would be this acceleration vector. And if we keep doing this, we find that the acceleration vectors basically always point inward when the path curves in a C curve like this. So the acceleration vector points to the opening of the C shape. Now let's take a look at this other road here. If we wanted to travel along this at constant speed, the velocity vectors would look like this. They would all be the same. And if the velocity vectors remain constant, that would mean that the acceleration vectors would all be zero, right? So what we found here is one way to detect if a path is straight or not. Basically, in flat space, a straight path has zero acceleration when we travel along it at a constant speed. So we know that this path is curved because we see non-zero acceleration vectors, but this path is straight because the acceleration is zero. Now let's consider the equivalent of straight paths on curved surfaces. So again, let's take a look at the tangent velocity vectors along this road. So this path is zigzagging back and forth, but it's also traveling uphill. So the tangent velocity vectors will be zigzagging back and forth, but they'll also be pointing upward somewhat to go up the slope of the hill. And the inclination of the velocity vectors will change depending on how steep the hill is at any given point. So this means that the acceleration vectors, not only will they point inward at these C curves, they will also point slightly upward or downward in certain places when the car's vertical velocity is changing. Now let's take a look at this other road. It moves up and down over some hills, so while the velocity vectors will point forward, they'll also have an upward or downward slope to them. Now, the acceleration vectors will sort of point downward for this C-curve here, and they'll point upward for this C-curve over here, which is somewhat hidden behind this hill. 
So you'll notice that both of these roads have acceleration vectors. So neither of these roads is perfectly straight. And that's because the ground surface in both of these cases is curved. So it's impossible to travel in a completely straight line because the ground is curved. But there is a difference between these two roads. This road over here is sort of going as straight as possible in the forward direction. Whereas this road over here is sort of wandering back and forth instead of going directly from the start to the finish. So in fact, this path is a geodesic curve because it travels in the forward direction as straight as possible along the curved surface. Whereas this path is not a geodesic because it wanders back and forth. And this difference isn't just something we can see with our eyes. There's a very real mathematical difference between these two curves. You'll notice that on the geodesic curve, the acceleration vectors all exist in the same vertical plane that slices vertically through the path. In fact, all of these acceleration vectors are actually normal to the surface. So just to be clear, when looking at a surface, the normal vectors are always pointing directly out of the surface, whereas tangential vectors will lie in the plane tangent to the surface, which is perpendicular to the normal vector. So the acceleration vectors are always pointing directly in or out of the surface, but never from side to side in a direction that's tangent to the surface. Whereas with this curve that wanders around, the acceleration vectors have a normal component that points directly out of the surface, but there's also a tangential component of the acceleration that points from side to side because the curve is wandering around. So this brings us to our definition of a geodesic curve. In curved space, a geodesic path has zero tangential acceleration when we travel along it at constant speed. So when we say zero tangential acceleration, we mean that the acceleration vector is always pointing directly out of the surface in the normal direction. So now that we have a definition for geodesic curves, we need a plan to find geodesic curves on a surface. So to compute geodesic curves, we need to find curves whose acceleration vector is only pointing in the normal direction to the surface. So the acceleration vector will normally have a normal component and a tangential component, and we need to find curves where the tangential acceleration is equal to zero, so that only the normal component exists. And this property will give us curves that give the straightest possible path between two points. So before we go looking for geodesic curves on surfaces, I'm going to give you a quick reminder of how surfaces and curves work. So usually we start with the two-dimensional UV plane and put the UV plane through some sort of function which stretches and bends it so that it becomes a 2D surface living in 3D space. So a given point in the UV plane will get mapped to some XYZ point in 3D space. And I usually write the function as R of U and V, where R is a position vector in 3D space. And if we want to draw a curve on this surface, we just draw the curve in the UV plane first as a function of some curve parameter lambda, and then we put it through the function to bring it into 3D space onto the surface. So I'm kind of abusing notation here, but I'm using the position vector capital R to denote the curve as R of lambda, as well as the surface, which is R of U and V. And recall that the partial derivatives of the position vector r are just tangent vectors to the surface. So partial r by partial u gives us tangent vectors along the u curves, partial r by partial v gives us tangent vectors along the v curves, and partial r by partial lambda gives us tangent vectors along the curve parameterized by lambda. All right, so to go after geodesic curves now, we need to look at the acceleration vector along a curve, which is the second derivative of r with respect to lambda. So if you watched video 12 in this series on the metric tensor, you'll be familiar with the tangent velocity vector along a curve, which we've expanded here out in terms of the u and v variables using the multivariable chain rule. So to get the acceleration vector, we just take the derivative of this velocity vector. So that means taking the derivative of this term and this term. So with this derivative, since we have a product of two terms, we need to use the product rule. So the derivative of this term results in two new terms. 
In the first one, the derivative is applied to du by d lambda. And in the second term, the derivative is applied to the basis tangent vector partial r by partial u. And similarly, we get two extra terms for the v variable portion. So this term and this term are easy enough to understand, but these two terms have the derivative of the u and v basis vectors with respect to lambda. So that is going to take a little bit of work to figure out. So we know by multivariable chain rule that the lambda derivative operator can be expanded out in a linear combination of the u and v derivative operators like this. So d by d lambda of the u basis vector is really equal to this. So we act on the u basis vector with these partial derivatives with respect to u and v. So we get this expression with these two second order derivatives. And we can do something similar for the v basis vector, and we get an expression with these two second order derivatives. So originally we had this expression for the acceleration vector, and on the previous slide we've derived expressions for this derivative and this derivative, which are here and here. So we're just going to sub in these expressions here, and we end up with this big expression here. So you'll notice that with this big expression, we have two types of terms. These two terms here only involve the first derivative of the position vector r. So we know that these exist in the tangent plane, since first derivative velocity vectors are always tangent vectors. But these other four terms here involve second order derivatives of the position vector r. So we don't know if these lie tangent to the surface or not. So I'm just gonna rearrange this expression a bit and again, these two vectors are definitely in the tangent plane to the surface, and these four terms at the bottom might be tangent to the surface, or they might be normal to the surface, or they might be a mix of both. So this formula for the acceleration is getting pretty ugly, so I'm going to suggest a way to make it look nicer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the u variable with u1 and replace the v variable with u2. And adding these indexes 1 and 2 will allow us to rewrite this big expression using the Einstein summation convention. So these first two terms can be written as a summation like this. It's a single summation over i, where i goes from 1 to 2. And these four terms here can be written as this term with two summations, 1 over i and 1 over j, each from 1 to 2. And we can write this summation because each of these four terms has two single derivatives with respect to lambda, and then one second order derivative of the position vector r. Okay, so we've cleaned things up a bit, and again, we know for sure that this part is definitely a vector that's in the tangent plane to the surface, but these parts over here might not be tangent to the surface. So to go after the geodesics, we need to figure out if this portion is tangent or normal to the surface, or a mix of both. So with this expression, these vectors here, which are second order derivatives of the position vector r, these are the mysteries. We need to understand these better. So these second order derivatives here are just 3D vectors living in 3D space. And that means we can expand them out as a linear combination of 3D basis vectors. So we could expand these out in terms of the standard x, y, z vector basis, but we're actually going to choose a different basis instead. We're actually going to use the two tangent vectors from the u1 and u2 coordinates along the surface, which give us a basis for the 2D tangent plane. And for the third basis vector, we're going to use a vector normal to the surface. So what we're gonna do is we're going to build these vectors out of a linear combination of these three basis vectors here. These two tangent vectors in the tangent plane and this normal vector. Now, how much of each of these basis vectors do we need? Or in other words, what are the components of this vector in this basis? Well, we don't actually know the components at all, so we're just going to make up new variables for the components since they're unknown. So we're gonna use these variables here. These lij terms, these are called the second fundamental form. And lij tells us the normal components of this second order derivative with respect to ui and uj. 
and these capital gamma symbols, these are called the Christoffel symbols, and these give us the tangential components of the second order derivative vector. So gamma 1 ij tells us how much of the u1 basis vector we need, and gamma 2 ij tells us how much of the u2 basis vector we need. So here is our 3D vector basis with the surface normal vector and the two tangent vectors. So if this is the second order derivative vector that we want, then gamma 1 ij would be this component along the first tangent vector. Gamma 2 ij would be this component along the second tangent vector direction. And lij would be this component along the normal direction. Okay, so we have this formula here for the second order derivative vectors. And I'm going to group these two terms together using Einstein notation with a sum over k to make things even more compact. Now the next thing we need to do is solve for these gamma terms, the Christoffel symbols. So notice that this normal vector n hat is by definition always going to be normal to this tangent plane here. And that means that the dot product of n hat with any of the tangent vectors is always going to be zero because the normal vector and the tangent vectors are perpendicular by definition. So to solve for the Christoffel symbols, we can take this formula here and take the dot product with a tangent vector on both sides. And so we get this and this term will go to zero since n hat is perpendicular to the tangent vector. And so on the right hand side, we're left with the Christoffel symbols summed with this dot product of tangent vectors. But this dot product of tangent basis vectors is just the metric tensor by definition. So we can rewrite this as the components of the metric tensor. So now we have this. And to isolate the Christoffel symbols, we need to get rid of these metric tensor components. So recall that by definition, the summation of the metric tensor components with the inverse metric tensor components gives us the Kronecker delta. So we can sum on both sides with the inverse metric components, and this becomes the Kronecker delta mk. And by the Kronecker delta cancellation rule, we can cancel these k indexes and just write the m index. And so we get this. This is our formula for the Christoffel symbols. And we're not as concerned with the second fundamental form here, but we can also solve for it in a similar way by dotting both sides with the normal vector. Now this term will go to zero since the normal vector is perpendicular to the tangent vector. And by definition, the length of the normal vector is one, so n dot n just goes to one. So this is the formula for the second fundamental form components right here. And if we want a concrete expression for the normal vector, you can just use this formula here involving cross products where EI and EJ are just the tangent vectors for the UI and UJ coordinates. And since these two vectors lie in the tangent plane, their cross product will always be a vector that's perpendicular to the tangent plane. And we also divide this vector by its length to ensure it has length one. Okay, so we're done basically all the painful math in this video. And what we have here is our equation for the acceleration vector along a curve right here, where these second order derivatives are given by this formula here, where the Christoffel symbols and second fundamental form are given by these formulas. So if you're wondering why we did all this extra work when this first formula seemed to be perfectly good, You'll notice that if we plug this formula into the second derivatives up here, we get this equation here. And notice how all these terms in this equation are either given using the tangent vectors or the normal vector. So we can actually group these terms together since they're all just multiples of the tangent vector partial r by partial u with index k. So how does that help us? Well, recall our plan all along was to find geodesic curves, which are curves where the acceleration vector is always normal to the surface. And earlier we talked about how we can break up the acceleration vector into a tangential part and a normal part. Well, that's exactly what we've just done with this formula here. We broke up the acceleration vector into a tangential part and a normal part.
And if the geodesics are curves where the acceleration vector is always normal, that means that geodesics will always have a tangential part of the acceleration that is equal to zero. So setting this formula here to zero is an effective way of detecting whether or not a curve is a geodesic. So setting the expression for the tangential component equal to zero gives us the geodesic equation. So any curve parameterized by lambda, which satisfies this geodesic equation, is in fact a geodesic curve. And these geodesic curves are the paths that beams of light will follow in curved spacetime. So if this geodesic equation looks like a bunch of random nonsense symbols, please watch the next video in the series where I will walk through an example of using this equation to find geodesics on a curved surface. So just to summarize this video, we said that geodesic curves are the equivalent of straight lines in curved spaces and will give us the shortest distance between two points. And our definition of geodesic curves on a surface are curves whose acceleration vector points completely in a direction normal to the surface and doesn't have any tangential acceleration. And then we derived this formula for the acceleration vector, which involves the Christoffel symbols and the second fundamental form. And since geodesics have zero tangential acceleration, that means that geodesic curves must obey this equation here where the tangential component of acceleration is zero. And this is called the geodesic equation.